morning, our scripture is from John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19. And like I said last week, I hope that um, you'll start bringing your Bibles to church because in the sermon is a great opportunity to read the text more closely. One of my goals during every sermon is to try to read the text closely, and hopefully it's an opportunity to make a few notes, underline a few things, and to go back to it to help us to become better readers and to understand the Bible better. So like I said, our passage is from John chapter 12, verses 12 to 19, and I'm going to be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. It's just slightly different than the NIV, but if you're reading the NIV, you'll certainly be able to follow along. John chapter 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it. As it is written, do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written of him and been done to him. So the crowd had been with him from the beginning, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. And it was because they heard that he had performed this sign that the crowd went out to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word and the ways that it shows us who you are and reveals you to us. God, that your word is a living word. Holy God, we pray that you would speak to us through your living word today and through the power of your Holy Spirit, that we would understand you better and see you more clearly. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the last week in our series of sermons called Pictures of Jesus. And we're looking at different images of Jesus that we've encountered in the Gospel of John. And this week, we're looking at the one that I think is probably my least favorite image of Jesus. It's the image of Palm Sunday, of Jesus riding into Jerusalem on the back of a donkey. And the reason it's my least favorite is, quite honestly, I've always hated preaching on Palm Sunday. And the reason I've hated preaching on Palm Sunday is because I never know what to do with it. Is it a tragedy or is it a triumph? Now... I said this in the first service, and it's true. I actually was going to assign this to Eric, but (laughs) since he's being ordained today, I thought I'd give him the week off and let him just focus on the ordination service, but next year, he's got to start working on his Palm Sunday service, (laughs) because he is on. So as I was reading this passage about the palms, you know, and, and you think about, you know, we all have been given these palms so we can wave them in the air during the songs or whatever. As I thought about this passage of the Palms and as I prayed about what the text teaches us and what it says to us, I started to come to an understanding of what's happening here. I think what's happening is that Palm Sunday is a study in missing the point, of not understanding what's going on and of completely understanding, misunderstanding Jesus and also misunderstanding God and how God's at work in the world. I think the people in this passage simply didn't know what was going on or what to make of it. It's not only that, but you know, have you ever been in a situation where you didn't quite get what you were supposed to do, that you didn't quite meet the expectations, and you didn't really understand the moment? Probably the most embarrassing time that's ever happened to me was about, I think it was 11 years ago. I was 32 years old, and I'd been invited to a retirement dinner for a colleague of mine, another pastor. And it was at a hotel in Princeton, and I went wearing a pair of jeans and a shirt like this. And I drove up to the hotel, and I go in, and I get to the ballroom area, and there are probably 400 people there. And as I walk in, I realize all the women are wearing dresses, and all the men are wearing suits, and I'm in jeans. And then I went and I got my place card for the table, And I went and I found my table, and I found out I'd been seated right next to the president of Princeton Seminary. So here I am in my jeans and my shirt, and he's in a suit and tie, of course. 
And I sat down next to him, and I knew him pretty well. And I, I, I said, Dr. Gillespie, I have to confess, I'm kind of embarrassed because I'm totally underdressed. I guess I didn't understand what I was supposed to do. And he said, well, Ryan, you are underdressed. <laughs> he said, and just as a rule of thumb, if you're going to be in a room of old people, you should always wear a coat and tie. And I thought, that's good advice. And then he graciously said, he said, the bad news is you're underdressed for this occasion, but the good news is if the Son of Man returns, you're the only one who's properly attired. So I was grateful for how generous he was. But it was very, it was just embarrassing to be there wearing the wrong thing, looking the wrong way, and clearly being the only person in the room who didn't actually understand what's expected of you in that moment. In the passage that we read today, nobody seems to understand what's expected of them in the moment, and how could they possibly know? But here's the thing. I think sometimes when it comes to Palm Sunday, we misunderstand the moment. Even scholars don't always understand it. You know, one of the things about reading Bibles is we'll sit down in a group, and sometimes when we read the Bible, we'll say, you know, let's read this passage, and people will open it up, and the first thing they'll do is they'll read the heading above the text. But I want you to know that's not actually part of the Bible. It's not in the original text. It's some editor has decided what it should say. So when I opened my Bible and I looked at this passage, here's what the editor had to say. Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Or another Bible, the NIV, said the triumphal entry. That's what it tells us. So already it seems that the editors who put together the Bible that we read have made a decision about how we should interpret this text. They're taking the triumph side, not the tragedy side of the argument. But are they right? Is that really what's happening? Is it really Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem? Well, it's an open question, and it's kind of a hard question, and there's no straightforward answer. Because when we look at the text, we see evidence on both sides, and I think it's actually something that's happening that no one quite gets. When we read the passage, it says that Jesus is riding into town on the colt of a donkey. And then we get to the reaction of the crowd, and we all know this reaction. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Clearly, clearly the crowd believes that Jesus is coming as the conquering hero, as the King, as the one who's come to deliver them. That word Hosanna, it means God save us. They're crying out that they would be saved. And there's evidence in this passage that the people believed that Jesus was coming as a conquering hero. And there are things that we might not know on a simple reading of the text. The first thing is this. The first thing is that they were waving palm branches. Now when they were waving these palm branches, palm branches were actually a sign of national pride for the Israelites. We know this because archaeologists have uncovered coins from that era, and they find that coins throughout the Roman realm on the front of them, they would have stamped the face of the emperor. But of course, the Israelites didn't like to have the face of the emperor on their coins, so coins that were stamped in Israel were stamped with the image of a palm branch. Because a palm branch was a sign of national pride. It's, it's as if he was marching into a city in our day and age and people were waving their national flags, singing his praises. It would be like Jesus going into Washington, D.C. or New York in a ticker tape parade in the back of a fancy car with the ticker tape coming down and flags waving on every corner, people singing his praises. The other thing is that we see where they're thinking that he's coming as a conquering hero is the psalm that they're quoting. They're quoting Psalm 118 in this passage, and here's the longer version of it. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It's marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, Hosanna. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you, give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. This psalm of praise and acclamation is a psalm that scholars believe was written after a victory in battle. That is, 
a victor came home, people would sing this psalm of praise, singing that God would save them, trusting that this person who had rescued them from danger was the one who was their savior. They were quoting Psalm 118, a psalm of victory, a psalm of power, a psalm of authority, trusting that Jesus was coming to rescue them. But to rescue them from what? The people had hoped that Jesus was coming to rescue them from the hand of the Romans. They wanted to be free of the occupying power. They wanted to be free of their oppressors. They wanted to have their own political reality. And they were hoping that Jesus was the one who would be exalted. But there are a few signs, even in the passage, that tell us that what they hope for is not what they're going to get. And there's one sign in particular. It's that the passage tells us that Jesus rode in on the colt of a donkey that he rode into Jerusalem on a young donkey. It's not really the, 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 the ride of a, of a king. A king would have ordinarily ridden in on a, on a charger, on a big, powerful horse decked out with armor. A king would have been sitting up there in a regal position. A deliverer would have been marching in with warriors at his side. He would have been riding in in something regal. You know, in our day and age, you'd ride in a limousine. Not in a beat up truck. But Jesus rode in on the most simple, the most ordinary of vehicles into the gates of Jerusalem. As he came in, he was so humble, in spite of the fact that everyone was singing his praises. This is an important moment in the passage. It's important because the people didn't quite understand what they were seeing. It shows they didn't quite understand Jesus, but they wanted him to be powerful. They wanted him to be filled with authority. They wanted him to be the one who would save them and rescue them and deliver them. And he would. Not in the way that they expected. There's a professor who teaches at Baylor University. He's actually a professor of literature, but he's also a Baptist pastor. So he preaches quite a bit. His name is Ralph Wood. And he said he thinks that many times Christians misunderstand this passage and misunderstand this Sunday and misunderstand this moment because we've called it the wrong thing. We call it Palm Sunday. He said, but really we should call it Donkey Sunday. Because Jesus rode in on the donkey. And he said the most significant thing in the passage are not the palms, it's not the crowds, it's the donkey. Now, it'd be tough to, you know, give everyone a donkey to wave around, I guess. Or, I don't know, a donkey, I don't know what we'd do. It'd be tough, so maybe it's for practical reasons that we call it Palm Sunday. But his point is, is that Jesus came in with such humility. He came in so differently than the world expected, than the people who were waiting and praying for him expected that it threw everyone off and they misunderstood it. The crowd thought that Jesus was coming for glory, and he was, but not the kind of glory that they had been hoping for and praying for and longing for and expecting. And this actually tells us something about who God is. It helps us to understand more fully the good news of the gospel. They thought Jesus was coming to sit on a throne, but Jesus was coming to Jerusalem to instead hang on the cross. The disciples thought that Jesus was coming for glory. Instead, he was coming to be glorified through his death. I think many times we misunderstand the meaning of the cross because we don't quite understand the depth of shame in the cross or the power of the cross. In Jesus' time, for him to say, no, I'm not coming to sit on the throne. I'm coming to hang on a cross. It would be like someone coming saying, no, no, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be the president. I'm not going to take charge. I'm going to sit on an electric chair. It's really the equivalent. It's, it's, a, it's an implement of torture. It's an implement of death. It's an implement of, of shame. But Jesus came into Jerusalem to be shamed, to bear our shame for us. It's not just the crowd that misunderstood Jesus, though. There's another group that misunderstood Jesus, but they misunderstood him from the other side. The other group that misunderstood Jesus was the Pharisees. Think about the end of this passage where it says, The Pharisees then said to one another, You see, you can do nothing. 
look, the world's gone after him, the king of Israel. You have to read it derisively. You know that, look, the Pharisees said to one another, you can do nothing. You can't help these people. They're hopeless and worthless. They don't get it, is what they were saying. The Pharisees, they saw the donkey, and they were embarrassed by it. They thought, what kind of savior would ride in on a ridiculous animal like this? These people are too far gone. They don't understand righteousness. They don't understand goodness. They don't understand the holiness and the power of God. That's what the Pharisees were saying. These people, they just don't get it. They're too far off. They miss the point. They're fools, is what they said. They missed the mark, too. They, too, thought that Israel's deliverer would come in power with authority. They, too, thought that Israel's deliverance would happen with someone who was riding in, perhaps, on a charger, or coming in who had lived a life that was, in their mind, righteous enough. Certainly not someone like Jesus. Certainly not someone who appealed to the ordinary people that they looked down on and scoffed at. Here's kind of the ironic part about this passage. That on both ends, the crowd and the Pharisees, when you take them together, they're a study in missing the point. But they both miss the point from opposite ends of the spectrum. The crowd, they looked at Jesus and thought, he should be powerful and great and rule over us like everyone else. The Pharisees looked at him and said, this couldn't possibly be him. He's too embarrassing. But none of them could have anticipated or none of them could have possibly thought that what it really led to, what Jesus' triumphal entry, his real triumph really was to go to the cross, which is both a triumph and a tragedy at the same time. But the triumph is not that Jesus was victorious over their worldly foes, but that Jesus delivered us from the power of sin and death. The tragedy is not that Jesus died on the cross. The tragedy is that the crowd of people and the Pharisees and people like us are the ones who put him there in the first place. But it's not just triumph and tragedy. There's a third thing at work here which is greater than both of them. It's the power of the grace of God. That's what Palm Sunday is actually all about. It's about the power and the grace of God. It's about the power of God that doesn't work in the way that we imagine that power ordinarily works, but it works sometimes backwards, sometimes in ways that we have a difficult time seeing because it turns the world upside down. It's the kind of power that brings life out of death. It's the kind of power that takes our worst intentions and takes it and transforms it and can even turn it into something like the cross that saves us from ourselves and from our sin. It's an incredible vision of power. But it's also about the mercy of God. He did not turn his back on us, did not walk away from us, did not leave us in our sin to our own destruction, but instead in freedom chose to save us from our sin by the sacrifice of his own son, Jesus. It's the power of God to overcome sin and death and destruction. So what do we do with all this? We read a passage like this. We think about Jesus' triumphal and tragic entry into Jerusalem. And what do we make of it? What do we do with it? Here's what I think we do. The first thing is, is I hope it drives us to our knees in thanksgiving. All throughout the Gospel of John, what we've seen is that Jesus didn't do anything on accident. Everywhere he went, he went with intention and with purpose. And when Jesus went into Jerusalem, he went with intention and with purpose. He knew that he was going to be glorified by being raised up on a cross. He knew that he would show the grace and the power of God through his death and his resurrection, and he did it willingly because he loves us. I hope it drives us to our knees in thanksgiving. But I hope it also focuses our minds for the coming week. 
I didn't grow up in a tradition where we made much of Holy Week. As a matter of fact, we didn't make much of Easter. And the tradition I grew up in, we said, well, why would we celebrate Easter? Because every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection. And while that's true, it doesn't highlight or, or give full power to this one Sunday when we really celebrate the resurrection of Jesus and the power of God at work for us. And I was talking to Jen, and she, my wife, and she had a conversation with someone this week who said she always hated Holy Week because she found it depressing and it took away from the joy of Easter Sunday. I hope instead what this Palm Sunday does for us, the triumph and the tragedy is this, is that it focuses our minds and it prepares us for the week to come. And we will make a decision today to go on a journey with Jesus that we'll reread these last chapters of the Gospel of John, starting in chapter 12, ending in chapter 21, that we'll read them this week, thinking about the events that happened. And that you'll come and you'll worship with us on Thursday night as we remember that Jesus washed his disciples' feet and shared the Last Supper with his disciples as he was preparing them for what was to come. That on Friday we'll take time ourselves to focus on Jesus' sacrifice for us, that he gave up his life for us. That we'll gather again on Saturday night at 7.30 to worship together, to focus on the scripture and to think about that mysterious moment in the midst of the night when Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of God. And that we'll go out of the sanctuary singing together to the front to our new fire where we'll light candles being reminded that in Jesus' resurrection, he has given us new life and new light and calls us to be the light of the world because he is the light of the world living in us. And that we'll be ready to come next Sunday morning to sing our praises, to give thanks to God, to rejoice for the power of the resurrection and the new life that God has given us in Jesus. Mm-hmm.